Hi, welcome to another First Chapter Friday. I noticed from our summer book club that a lot of kids prefer fantasy. So the next couple episodes that I'm going to film will be fantasies that I think people should check out. This one is Beyond the Deep Woods and it is part of the Edge Chronicles book one. And it's written by Paul Stewart and in illustrations, and there are tons in here, part of the reason I love this series is because of the illustrations and they're by Chris Riddell. All right, so in case you're wondering about my braids, the main character, it has a head full of like braids sticking out all over the place. So I thought it'd be fun. All right, chapter one, the Snatchwood Cabin. Twig sat on the floor between his mother's knees and curled his toes in the thick fleece of the Tilder rug. It was cold and drafty in the cabin. Twig leaned forward and opened the door of the stove. I want to tell you the story of how you got your name, his mother said. But I know that story, mother mine, Twig protested. Spelled aside, Twig felt her warm breath on the back of his neck and smelled the pickled trip weed that she had eaten for lunch. He wrinkled his nose. Like so much of the food which the wood trolls relished, Twig found trip weed disgusting, particularly when it's pickled. It was slimy and it smelled of rotten eggs. This time he'll be a little different, he heard his mother saying. This time I will finish the tale. Twig frowned. I thought I'd already heard the ending. Spelda tousled her son's thick black hair. He's grown so fast, she thought, and wiped a tear from the end of her rubbery button nose. A tale can have many endings, she said sadly, and watched the purple light from the fire gleaming on Twig's high cheekbones and sharp chin. From the moment you were born, she began, as she always began, you were different. Twig nodded. It had been painful, so painful being different when he was growing up. Yet it amused him now to think of his parents' surprise when he appeared, dark, green-eyed, smooth-skinned, and already with unusually long legs for a wood troll. He stared into the fire. The luff wood was burning very well. Purple flames blazed all around the stubby logs as they bumped and tumbled around inside the stove. The wood trolls had many types of wood to choose from, and each had its own special properties. Scent wood, for instance, burned with a fragrance that sent those who breathed it drifting into a dream-filled sleep, while wood from the silvery turquoise lullaby tree sang as the flames lapped at its bark. Strange, mournful songs they were, and not at all to everyone's taste. And then there was the blood oak, complete with its parasitic sidekick a barbed creeper known as the terry vine. Obtaining blood oak wood was hazardous. Any wood troll who did not know his wood lore was liable to end up satisfying the tree's love for flesh. For the blood oak and the terry vine were two of the greatest dangers in the dark and perilous deep woods. Certainly the wood of the blood oak gave off a lot of heat and it neither smelled nor sang, but the way it wailed and screamed as it burned put off all but a few. No, among the wood trolls, Luffwood was by far the most popular. It burned well, and they found its purple glow restful. Twig yawned as Spelda continued her story. Her voice was high-pitched but guttural. It seemed to gurgle in the back of her throat. Four months, you were already walking upright, she was saying, and Twig heard the pride in his mother's words. Most wood troll children remained down on their knuckles until they were at least 18 months old. 
But, Twig whispered softly, drawn back inside the story despite himself, he was already anticipating the next part. It was time for the but. Every time it arrived, Twig would shudder and hold his breath. But, she said, although you were so ahead of the others physically, you would not speak. Three years old you were, and not a single word. She shifted around in her chair. And I don't have to tell you how serious that can be. Once again, his mother sighed. Once again, Twig screwed up his face in disgust. Something Tag Hare had once said came back to him. Your nose knows where you belong. Twig had taken it to mean that he would always recognize the unique smell of his home. But what if he had been wrong? What if the wise old oak elf had been saying in his usual roundabout way that because his nose didn't like what it smelled, this was not his home? Twig swallowed guiltily. This was something he had wished so often as he'd lain in his bunk after yet another day of being teased and taunted and bullied. Through the window, the sun was sinking lower in the dappled sky. The zigzag silhouettes of the deep wood pines were glinting like frozen bolts of lightning. Twig knew there would be snow before his father returned that night. He thought of Tuntum out there in the deep woods far beyond the anchor tree. Perhaps at that very moment, he was sinking his axe into a trunk of blood oak. Twig shuddered. His father's felling tails had filled him with deep horror on many a howling night. Although he was a master carver, Tuntum Snatchwood earned most of his money from the illicit repair of sky pirate ships. This meant using buoyant wood, and the most buoyant wood of all was the blood oak. Twig was uncertain of his father's feelings towards him. Whenever Twig returned to the cabin with a bloodied nose or blacked eyes or clothes covered in slung mud, he'd wanted his father to wrap him up in his arms and to soothe the pain away. Instead, Tuntum would give him advice and make demands. Bloody their noses, he'd said once. Black their eyes and throw not mud but dung. Show them what you're made of. Later, when his mother was smoothing Heilberry salve onto his bruises, she would explain that Tuntum was only concerned to prepare him for the harshness of the world outside. But Twig was unconvinced. It was not concern that he had seen in Tuntum's eyes, but contempt. Twig absentmindedly wound a strand of his long, dark hair round and round his finger as Spelda went on with her story. Names, she was saying. Where would we wood trolls be without them? They tame the wild things of the deep woods and give us our own identity. Ne'er sip of a nameless soup, as the saying goes. Oh, Twig, how I fretted when, at three years old, you are still without a name. Twig shivered. He knew that any wood troll who died without a name would be doomed to an eternity in open sky. The trouble was that until an infant had uttered its first word, the naming ritual could not take place. Was I really so silent, mother mine? said Twig. Spelda looked away. Not a single word passed your lips. I thought perhaps you were like your great-grandfather Weasel. He never spoke either. She sighed. So... On your third birthday, I decided to perform the ritual anyway. I, did great-grandfather Weasel look like me? Twig interrupted. No, Twig, said Spelda. 
there's never been a Snatchwood nor any other wood troll who has ever looked like you. Twig tugged at the twist of hair. My ugly, Spelda chuckled. As she did so, her downy cheeks puffed out and her small charcoal gray eyes disappeared in the folds of leathery skin. I don't think so, she said, and leaned forwards, wrapping her long arms around Twig's chest. You'll always be my beautiful boy, she paused. Now, where was I? The naming ritual, Twig reminded her. He had heard the story so often, he was no longer sure what he could remember and what he had been told. As the sun rose, Spelda had taken the well-worn path which led to the anchor tree. There she tethered herself to its bulky trunk and set off into the dark woods. This was dangerous, not only because of the unseen perils that lurked in the deep woods, but because there was always the chance that the rope would snag and break. Wood Troll's deepest terror was being lost. Those who did stray from the path and lose their way were vulnerable to attacks from the Gloam Glosser, the wildest of all the wild creatures in the deep woods. Every wood troll lived in constant terror of an encounter with the fearsome beast. Spelda herself had often frightened her older children with tales of the forest boogeyman. If you don't stop being such a naughty wood troll, she would say, the gloom glosser will get you. Deeper and deeper into the deep woods, Spelda went. All around her, the forest echoed with howls and shrieks of concealed beasts. She fingered the amulets and the lucky charms around her neck and prayed for a swift and safe return. Finally, getting to the end of her tether, Spelda pulled a knife, a naming knife, from her belt. The knife was important. It had been made especially for her son, as knives were made for all the wood troll children. They were essential for the naming ritual, and when youngsters came of age, each one was given his or her individual naming knife to keep. Spelda gripped the handle tightly, reached forwards, and, as the procedure demanded, hacked off a piece of wood from the nearest tree. It was this little bit of deep wood which would reveal her child's name. Spelda worked quickly. She knew only too well the sound of chopping wood would attract inquisitive and possibly deadly attention. When she was done, she tucked the wood under her arm, trotted back through the woods, untied herself from the anchor tree, and returned to the cabin. There, she kissed the piece of wood twice and threw it into a fire. With your brothers and sisters, the names came at once, Spelda explained. Snodpill, henchweed, poo sniff, as clear as you like. But with you, the wood did nothing but crackle and hiss. The deep woods have refused to name you. And yet I have a name, said Twig. Indeed you have, said Spelda. Thanks to Tag Hair. Twig nodded. He remembered the occasion so well. Tag Hair had just returned to the village after a long spell away. Twig remembered how overjoyed the wood trolls had all been to have the oak elf back among them. For Tag Hair, who was well-versed in the finer points of wood lore, was their advisor, their counselor, their oracle. It was to him that the wood trolls came with their worries. There was already quite a gathering beneath his ancient lullaby tree when we arrived, Spelda was saying. Tag Hair was sitting in his empty caterbird cocoon, holding forth about where he'd been and what he'd seen on his travels. The moment he saw me, however, his eyes opened wide and his ears rotated. Whatever is up? he asked. 
And I told him. I told him everything. Oh, for goodness sakes, pull yourselves together, he said. And when he pointed to you, tell me, he said, what is that round the little one's neck? That's his comfort cloth, I said. He won't let anyone touch it. He won't be parted from it, neither. His father tried once, said the boy was too old for such childish things. But he just curled up into a ball and cried and cried until we gave it back to him. Twig knew what was coming next. He'd heard it so many times before. Then Tagar said, Give it to me, and stared into your eyes with those big, Black eyes of his, all oak elves have eyes like that. They can see those parts of the world that remain hidden to others. And I gave him my comfort cloth, whispered Twig. Even now, he didn't like anyone touching it and kept it tightly knotted around his neck. That you did, continued Spelda. And I can scarce believe it to this day. But that wasn't all. Oh, no. Oh, no, echoed Twig. He took your cloth and he sort of stroked it all gentle-like, as if it were a living thing. And he traced the pattern on it with his fingertip ever so lightly. A lullaby tree, he said at last. And I saw he was right. I always thought it was a pretty pattern, all those squiggles and little stitches. But no, it was a lullaby tree, all right, plain as the nose on your face, Twig laughed. And the strange thing was, you didn't mind old tag hair touching your cloth. You just sat there all serious and silent. Then he gave you that stare his again and said in a soft voice, you're part of the deep woods, silent one. The naming ritual has not worked, but you are a part of the deep woods. A part of the deep woods, he repeated, his eyes glazing over. Then he raised his head and spread his wide arms. His name shall be Twig! Twig exclaimed, unable to keep silent a moment longer. That's right, said Spelda, laughing. Out you came with it just like that, Twig. The first word you ever spoke, and then Tag Hare said, You must look after him well, for this boy is special. Not different, but special. It was the one fact that had kept him going when the other wood troll children had picked on him so mercilessly. Not a single day had passed without some incident or other, but the worst time of all was when he had been set upon during the fateful truck bladder match. Before then, Twig had loved the game. Not that he was very good at it at all, but he had always enjoyed the excitement of the chase. For truck bladder was a game that involved a great deal of running about. It was played on a large square of land between the back of a village and the forest. The pitch was crisscrossed with well-worn paths, beaten out by generations of young wood trolls. Between these bare tracks, the grass grew thick and tall. The rules of the game were simple. There were two teams, with as many wood trolls on each side as the other wanted to play, and the aim was to catch the truck bladder, the bladder of a hamel horn stuffed with dry truck beans, and run 12 paces calling out the numbers as you went. If you managed that, you were allowed a shot at the central basket, which could double your score. However, since the ground was often slippery, the truck bladder always squidgy, and the entire opposing team was trying to wrest the ball away, this was not as easy as it sounded. In his eight years of playing the game, Twig had never once managed to score a truck bladder. 
On this particular morning, no one was having much luck. Heavy rain had left the pitch waterlogged, and the game kept stopping and starting, as time after time, wood troll after wood troll came sliding off the muddy paths. It wasn't until the third quarter that the truck bladder landed near enough to twig for him to seize it and start running. One, two, three, he yelled out as with the truck bladder wedged beneath the elbow of his left arm, he belted along the paths which led to the center of the pitch. The nearer to the basket you were when you reached 12, the easier it was to score. Four, five! In front of him, a half dozen members of the opposing team were converging on him. He startled down a path to the left. His opponents chased after him. Six, seven! To me, Twig! To me! Various members of his own team called out, Pass it! But Twig didn't pass it. He wanted to score. He wanted to hear his teammates' cheers, to feel their hands slapping him on the back. For once, he wanted to be the hero. Eight! Nine! He was completely surrounded. Pass it to me! He heard. It was harder, Gruff calling from the far side of the pitch. Twig knew that if he chucked the ball to him now, his friend would have a good chance of scoring for the team. But that was no good. You remembered who scored, not who set up the goal. Twig wanted everyone to remember that he had scored. He paused. Half the opposing team was almost upon him. He couldn't go forwards. He couldn't go back. He looked around at the basket. So near, and yet so far, and he wanted that goal. He wanted it more than anything. All at once, a little voice in his head seemed to say, But what's the problem? The rules say nothing about sticking to the path. Twig looked back toward the basket and swallowed nervously. The next instant, he did what no wood troll before had ever done. He left the path. The long grass whipped at his bare legs as he loped toward the basket. Ten! Eleven! Twelve! He screamed and dunked the bladder down through the basket. A truck bladder! He cried and looked around happily. A twenty-four pointer! I've scored a truck! He stopped. The wood trolls on both teams were glaring at him. There were no cheers, no slaps on the back. You stepped from the path, one of them shouted. No one steps from the path, cried another. But, but, Twig stammered. There's nothing in the walls that say. But the other wood trolls were not listening. They knew, of course, that the rules didn't mention keeping to the paths. But then why should they? In truck bladder, as in their lives, the wood trolls never, ever strayed from the paths. It was a given. It was taken as read. It would have made much sense to have had the rule telling them not to stop breathing. All at once, as if by some prearranged signal, the wood trolls fell on Twig. You lanky weirdo! They cried as they kicked him and punched him. You hideous, gangly freak! A sudden fiery pain tore through Twig's arm. It felt as if it had been branded. He looked up to see a wadge of his smooth flesh being viciously twisted by a handful of hard, spatula fingers. Hot, gruff, Twig whispered. The snatchwoods and the... Broke knots were neighbors. He and Hottergruff had been born within a week of each other, and they grew up together. Twig had thought they were friends. Hottergruff sneered and twisted the skin round still further. Twig bit into his lower lip and fought back the tears. Not because the pain in his arm, that he could bear, but because Hottergruff had now turned against him. As Twig stumbled home, battered, bruised and bleeding. 
It was the fact that he had lost his only friend that hurt most. Now, because he was different, he was also alone. Special, said Twig, and snorted. Yes, said Spelda. Even the Sky Pirates recognized that fact when they saw you, she added softly. That's why your father, her voice faltered, why we... That is why you must leave home. Twig froze. Leave home? What did she mean? He spun around and stared at his mother. She was weeping. I don't understand, he said. Do you want me to go? Of course I don't, Twig, she sobbed. But you'll be thirteen in less than a week. An adult. What will you do then? You cannot fell wood like your father. You're not built for it. (laughs) Where will you live? The cabin's already too small for you. And now the sky parrots know about you. Twig twisted the knot of hair round and round his finger. Three weeks earlier, he had gone with his father far into the deep woods, where the wood trolls felled and fashioned the wood that they sold to the sky pirates. Whereas his father could walk upright beneath the lowest branches, Twig had to stoop. Even that wasn't enough. Time and time again, he knocked his head until his scalp had become a mass of angry red grazes. In the end, Twig had no option but to crawl on his hands and knees to the clearing. Our latest felling recruit. Huntum had said to the sky pirate in charge of delivery that morning. The pirate glanced over his clipboard and looked Twig up and down. Looks too tall, he said, and went back to his paperwork. Twig stared at the sky pirate. Tall and upright, he looked magnificent with his tricorn hat and tooled leather breastplate, his power wings and waxed side whiskers. His coat was patched in places, but was with its ruffs and tassels. Golden buttons and braid, nonetheless splendid for that. Each of the numerous objects that hung from special hooks seemed to shout of adventure. Twig found himself wondering who the Sky Pirate had fought with that cutlass, with its ornately jeweled hilt, and what had caused the nick in its long curved blade. He wondered what marvels the sky pirate had seen through his telescope, what walls he had scaled with the grappling irons, and what distant places his compass had led him to. Suddenly the sky pirate looked up again. He caught Twig staring at him and raised a quizzical brow. Twig stared at his feet. Tell you what the Sky Pirate said to Tuntum. There's always a place for a tall young man on a sky ship. No, said Tuntum sharply. Thank you very much for the offer, he added politely. But no. Tuntum knew his son wouldn't last ten minutes on board a ship. The Sky Pirates were shiftless, shameless rogues. They would slit your throat as soon as look at you. It was only because they paid so well for the buoyant deep wood timber that the wood trolls had anything to do with them at all. The sky pirate shrugged. Just a thought, he said, and turned away. Pity, though, he muttered. As Twig crawled back through the deep woods behind his father, he thought of the ships he had watched flying overhead, sails full, soaring off, up and away. Sky he whispered, and his heart quickened. Surely, he thought, there are worse things to do. Back in the wood troll cabin, Spelda thought otherwise. Oh, those sky pirates, she grumbled. Tuntum should never have taken you to meet them in the first place. Now they'll be back for you as sure as my name, Spelda Snatchwood. But the sky pirate I saw didn't seem bothered whether I joined the crew or not, said Twig. Oh, that's what they pretend, said Spelda. But look what happened to Hobblebark and Hogwart. 
seized from their beds they were, and never seen again. Oh, Twig, I couldn't bear it if it happened to you. It would break my heart. Outside, the wind howled through the dense, deep woods. As darkness fell, the air was filled with the sound of wakening night creatures. Frumps coughed and spat. Quarms squealed, while the great band of bear beat its monstrous hairy chest and yodel to its mate. Far away in the distance, Twig could just make out the familiar rhythmical pounding of the slaughterers, still hard at work. What am I to do then? Twig asked softly. Spelda sniffed. In the short term, you're to go and stay with Cousin Snetterbark, she said. We've already sent the message, and he's expecting you. Just until things blow over, she added. Sky willing, you'll be safe there. And after, said Twig, I can come home again then, can't I? Yes, said Spelda slowly. Twig knew at once there was more to come. But, he said, Spelda trembled and hugged the boy's head to her chest. Oh, Twig, my beautiful boy, <laughs> she sobbed. There's something else I must tell you. Twig pulled away and looked up at her troubled face. There were tears rolling down his own cheeks now. What is it, mother mine? he asked nervously. Oh, love. Closer, spelled of curse. This isn't easy. She looked at the boy tearfully. Although I have loved you as my own since the day you arrived, you're not my son, Twig, nor is Tontum your father. Twig stared in silent disbelief. Then who am I? He said. Spelled a shrugged. We found you, she said, a little bundle, all wrapped up in a shawl at the foot of our tree. Found me, Twig whispered. Spelda nodded, leaning forward and touching the cloth knotted at Twig's neck. Twig flinched. My comfort cloth, he said. The shawl? Spelda sighed. The very same, she said. The shawl we found you wrapped in, the shawl you won't be parted from, even now. Twig stroked the fabric with trembling fingers. He heard Spelda sniff. Oh, Twig, she said, although we're not your parents, Tuntum and I loved you just like our very own. Tuntum asked me to say, Goodbye for him. He, he said. She stopped, overwhelmed with sadness. He said to tell you that that whatever happens, you must never forget. He loves you. And now the words were said. Spelda abandoned herself to grief completely. She wailed with misery and uncontrolled sobbing racked her entire body. Twig knelt across and wrapped his arms right around his mother's back. So I'm to leave at once, he said. It's for the best, Spelda said. But you will return, Twig, won't you? She added uncertainly. Leave me, my beautiful boy. I didn't ever want to have to tell you the end of the tale, but... <clears throat> Don't cry, said Twig. This isn't the end of the tale. Spelda looked up and sniffed. You're right, <sighs> she said and smiled bravely. It's more of a beginning, isn't it? Yes, that's what it is, Twig. A new start. And so his adventures begin. I'm going to um, show you maybe a couple other pictures beyond chapter one just to um, additionally hook you. 
And let's see, what else can I say? I felt like this book was kind of a combination fantasy if it met a series of unfortunate events. Because poor Twig. <laughs> Nothing goes right for Twig. Once one bad thing stops happening to him, a new bad thing happens to him. And it's humorous and you feel a lot of you feel a lot of um, compassion for this poor kid who just keeps on having one incident happen after another, being different. And I'm sure everyone in middle school can understand feelings like that. And then how does he make it through his first adventure, which happens in this book? I believe the Adventures with Twig, um, I think it was something like four books, happen um, with Twig as the main character. And then the Edge of um, the Edge Chronicles continue with other characters that are in the same world and tell their stories, sometimes like changing the generations and stuff like that. Anyways, thank you for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed it and it intrigued you.